What's up, everybody? How's it going? This is your boy, Darius Fentress, and you are in the studio with me today. And we have an amazing show for you. But first, make sure that you hit that subscribe button. If you want more good content, more great interviews to come, hit that subscribe button, like, comment, share, all that good stuff. Today, we have an amazing show. I have a great friend of mine, a brother who I met about five years ago, we were doing the Tyler Perry Medea farewell tour. We met for the first time there, and he's just a great brother. So here he is, my brother, Patrick Wright. Yo, what up, Darius, man? Thanks for having me, bro. Yeah, man, it's so good to have you on, man. And, uh, man, I'm, I'm just excited to be able to talk with you, man, about, you know, our craft, what we do, man. And you're an amazing musician, amazing producer. You have your own studio at your house. And we want to get into all that stuff, man, just to get behind the scenes, look at how you approach music, how you approach recording, all that stuff, man. So, man, with, just let, let, let the people know a little bit about yourself, man, where you're from and where you live in and, and all that good stuff, anything you want to put out there. Uh, okay, well, I'm Patrick Wright, as Darius told you, uh, uh, mainly a keyboard player, a producer from Fort Worth, Texas, born and raised, funky town. Uh, I still stay in Fort Worth. Um, I primarily have been doing gospel music for probably now about 20, 25 years. Yeah. Um, of course, I dibble and dabble in a little bit of everything. Uh, R&B, jazz, uh, a little country every now and again, some blues stuff. Uh, anything that really requires keyboards, like you, you can kind of sign me up for. Yeah. <laughs> That's what's up, man. And, you know... You know, you've been a little bit modest, man. You know, you're an amazing musician, and, you know, you've toured the world with some great artists. But tell, tell us a little about your role with uh, with Tamla Man. Oh, I, I guess I probably should have started with that. <laughs> uh, I've been I've been with Miss Tam and Mr. David for probably now, man, it's not probably about 17 years oh, or so. Oh, wow. Now. It's been that long? Yeah, it's been a really long time. Wow. Like, yeah, about 17. Yeah, well, I grew up on doing that. Like seriously, that's amazing, uh, bro. I I came in as keyboard player, and then kind of transitioned into being the MD. Maybe like a year or two later, uh, stayed in that position for man about twelve, no, about fourteen years. I was MDing for about fourteen years. Now Philip Bryant is MDing. Okay, I'm still on playing keys, uh, running tracks, still doing the whole nine, just kind of supporting from a different seat. Yeah. Uh, but like through that, man, I've been blessed to like do go a lot of places, do a lot of things with a lot of other people because of that. Yeah. yeah. Like that got my foot in the door to like pretty much work with anybody I wanted to in gospel music. Honestly, we've done like a lot of stuff with a lot of people. That's amazing, bro. And I, the crown jewel would probably be hanging out with Darius doing that <laughs> Medea tour, man. That was good times. Man. Oh, I tell people all the time, that was one of the funnest tours I ever did in my life. Absolutely, bro. Yeah, I don't know what it was, man. Just the whole band, the whole crew, everybody just gelled. It was like, it was just everybody got along for the most part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. That was amazing, man. For me, for me, that was like probably the only time, like that was, for me, that was the perfect tour. Yeah. Like what you said, everybody was just super cool, super professional. Yeah. Like everybody was A1 at every position. And not only could everybody play, act, and sing, everybody was really cool to be around. So it was like a cool hang every day. Yeah, man. Every day, man. We we just we had so much fun, man. We're gonna get into that more later, but I wanna I wanna get some more history like uh Pat, when did you start playing keyboards so i started playing keyboards at a pretty pretty early age I, I remember my first formal lessons i was probably about nine okay about nine or so uh, i started taking piano lessons at my school uh but everybody in my family kind of plays anyway okay uh but they always wanted me to get that the educational foundation of learning how to read music, like all that stuff. Yeah. So uh, I started about nine with the formal lessons. Of course, I was always in the gospel. We were not doing gospel in these piano lessons. Mm -hmm. but it was, so I was always in the gospel and jazz. Okay. 
So um, we had our, the musician that played at our church actually stayed with us. Like he lived with us and we had a piano at home. So he would always be showing me different stuff. Him and my older brother who also plays too. Nice. So they were, they were always showing me stuff. So I want to say from like nine to 19, I kind of dibbled and dabbled. But never really got serious about it until I was, I would say, 19. And I decided, I think this might be what I want to do. Yeah, man. That's crazy, man. I mean, you, you think about it, that's kind of late for some people like to make it that really decision. It really is. Yeah, man. It was super late. So, like, what I had to do from there is kind of like do double time. Mm. So, like, all the experience that I missed from, like, I would say, like, most most people were playing, like, 14 up, they kind of got serious about it. I was really into sports at that time. Right. I was really into sports. Um, I was decent at basketball. I got a scholarship uh, to to play basketball in college. Really? Talk, talk yeah, about that. I did I not know people. that. I didn't <laughs> <Yeah>. know that. <laughs> For, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, that, this is great because that's one thing we didn't do on tours. We didn't play much basketball but i had no clue pat like so so take me through that like in high school how 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 did all that happen so in high school um i was a standout in high school but i went to a small christian school okay over in arlington texas i went to uh, burton academy to um my junior year i was i think first team all district wow uh all deep i think i was did a defensive mvp my junior year, my senior year, I was district MVP, uh, first team all state. Did a couple uh, all star games, like the whole nine. Uh, I went to a smaller school out in Johnson County, Texas. Okay. Called Southwestern Adventist University. They, they offered me the most money to go. So. Right. Uh, I went. I got up there, and then I realized, oh my goodness. These people are really serious about me playing basketball. I was not that serious, Darius. I wasn't trying to wake up early in the morning and go running. I don't want to do none of that. Right. <laughs> so um, I, I I started out my um, my freshman year, and then I was like, man, this is a bit much. Because at that time, that was the time I was trying to transition into doing music. Right, okay. So um, I was already in uh, a couple music classes that semester anyway. Okay. So I went to the head of the music department and. um and we talked, and they ended up switching my scholarship over to music. Really? Yes. <laughs> man, that is so crazy, man. I had no clue, because you never talked about that, ever. Yeah, that's because that was so long ago. By the time I met you, I was a bum, Darius. I can't play basketball no more. I'm terrible, bro. <laughs> that's funny, man. No, that is, it's, it's funny, because... I had a similar path. Now, I never got to the college level playing basketball, but I was very serious from middle school going into high school. And by the time I got to my junior year, um, I stopped growing. And I was a center all that time, so I was the big guy. But by the time I got junior year, I was like the guard size, and I didn't have guard skills. And then, you know, music, too, was like starting to take over. Mm-hmm. So I understand, man. That, but that that is a great nugget, Pat. Thanks for for that for that information. <laughs> so so okay. So you get into into music around nineteen, like really seriously. So how long mm-hmm. is it before you start, like really seeing some headway as far as getting some opportunities to play with some reputable artists? Uh, you, I'm gonna be honest, man. It, it took a little while. Um, it took a little while, but I still had an inroad getting in because of my uncle. My uncle's Gerald Wright. Yeah. Who was um who was Kurt's manager for twenty plus years. Wow. Amazing. And uh he also managed uh Tamla and David Mann. Right, okay. So um I grew up just being around all the time, always at rehearsals, always at studio mm. sessions. Yeah. So they already knew me from gr- from growing up. Yeah. So when I started getting serious about it, of course, I did like the community choir route here in DFW. Yeah. Uh, my brother actually had a group, which is really what helped me like kind of refine my skills mm-hmm. was uh, was his group. He gave me an opportunity to like MD um, and arrange and produce records when at that time nobody was giving me that chance. Wow. Um, I used that whole I used that whole situation to kind of really refine my skills to get good at it. So when the opportunity did present itself, I was kind of ready already. So it wasn't a lot of like I I did have to learn on the job when I got with Tam. 
but I wasn't that that far behind because of the stuff that I had already been doing. Oh, that's amazing. So, Sh- shout out your brother's name for us. James Wright. Everybody calls him Jimmy. James Wright. Yeah, man. And and, and I was that the uh you had me play some percussion for him or Yes, you did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's all right, man. Yeah, that was some cool great music, man. Thank you, man. Appreciate yeah, it. For sure. Hey, so okay. So you're playing around, you find how how old were you, were you when you finally got with Tan? I think the first deal I did with them, I was probably like twenty three. Okay, all right. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's. She let out that "Got to Keep Moving" record, okay, uh, which was her debut her debut record, and they wanted to do an album release concert in Fort Worth, and I ended up getting the call, and it was like me, my cousin Eric, who was always with me mm-hmm. on, on bass, me, my cousin Eric, and Peabody. Oh yeah, yeah. Shout out to Peabody. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. That's funny, man. It's it, it's amazing, like our similarities, man. Because same here. Like I I grew up with family who was in the industry. You know, mm-hmm. my uncle Fred, my uncle Keith, being around commission and and just just being around and mm. growing up in the music. Then finally, kind of getting that opportunity with fam, and it's 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 amazing to see that we have that in common, man. So, okay, so you're, you're playing, you're gigging. At what point do you start getting into recording? Like, can you remember the first time you actually recorded keys or anything for a project or any, any album? So the first time I was recording, um, it wasn't for myself. It was at a studio called Patrick McGuire's. Yes, yes. I love um, that studio, do, man. Yes. And it was a community choir deal, but I don't remember who I don't remember who we were over there recording. But that was probably, man, maybe ninety nine. Okay. It like it was like a while ago. That's crazy. And that was like my first my first dive into uh, recording was like we did the session there. No, I'm I'm sorry, Darius. My first session was actually at um, Crystal Clear in Dallas. Okay. And um, we got in there, and I was just kind of, like, enamored. Like, it was like a situation where this thing kind of just uh, attracted me. Mm. Once we got in there, and I saw what the engineer was doing, and I saw all the magic that was being made yeah. on the spot. And like, and then from there, I was like, man, I got to figure this thing out. So I asked him, like, yo, what are y'all using? Uh, he told me, you know, we're using Pro Tools. This is pretty much what all the big studios use. Um Man, so it wasn't long after that, um, me and my brother went in and bought uh, a Digi 001. Ooh, yes. Yes. Uh, was it the rack it was, mount? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, man. The Digi 001. And I guess the thing was at the time, we didn't know that we probably should have had a Mac. Right. So we bought it and hooked it up to a PC. And when I tell you, it was just a world of trouble. Absolutely. And this is before I knew how to really troubleshoot anything. Right. So, like, the buffer size deal would pop up, like, anytime, once you get into recording, you're like, all right, all right, we're rolling, we're rolling. No, you're not. No, you're not. Like, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately stop. <laughs> right, right. So, I went through I went through that. I feel like for, like, a year, we were we were recording in Pro Tools um, using a... <laughs> Using a shower as the booth. Hey, man. Put egg crate in the shower. <laughs> Look, man, you got to do what you got to do, brother. <laughs> Closet, shower, bed, whatever, man. Serious. Yeah. yeah. So we had the bedroom as the control room. We had a closet as a booth, and then the, but the shower had the better sound, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> so we were yeah. really cutting all the all the vocals in the shower, uh, and that went on for probably about a year or so. Until we bought a G4. Oh, yeah. And then that literally, I feel like, changed my life. Yeah, yeah. That, because cause when, those, when those computers came out, like, it was another level of power that we were never used to. Like, I don't, we had never mm-hmm. seen anything like that before. And Seriously. That, that, that was before the cheese grater, right? That was a G5, I think. It was. Yeah, right. Yeah, the G. Okay. Man, but, okay, so y'all really were early on in the home studio thing. Like, 
Yeah, we were, and that was only that was really only because of like hanging out at studios, right? Like going to the you know going to Kirk sessions, going to Tam says you know just hanging out at the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always really curious enough to be asking engineers, "Hey, what are y'all doing? What are you using?" Right. Like, uh, like what plugin? I still do that to this day. What plugin is that? Right. Like, uh, <laughs> oh, and yeah. and that kind of got me on a, a decent home setup deal so it was like i always wanted to figure out like like i know at the time because they were in like you know million dollar studios right and i'm like there has to be a way because i knew other people that had home studios but the quality wasn't really like there mm -hmm. so i'm like there has to be a way to get the proper sound but while recording at home so i just kind of just was asking everybody annoying people asking a lot of questions uh at the time Jerome Harmon was playing in my church. Yes, sir. Shout out to yeah, Jerome. And he, yes, and you know, I, super producer Jerome Harmon. Yes. And uh, so I used to bug him every week. I was like the youth choir musician at that time. I would show up to all the rehearsals no matter what because I knew he was going to be there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he would just drop nuggets, tell me what to do, what not to do, what kind of gear to buy, what to stay away from. Yeah. And like having, having that guy that's kind of like, you know – kept me out of the like the hit and miss stuff right so i wasn't wasting money because like he was like telling me like back then well you need like focus right preamps and he was the one telling us to get the g4 and just just stuff like that that i wouldn't have known like without that yeah yeah that's amazing man so at that point in time what kind of projects were you guys taking on in that like early stage of y'all having the studio in, in at home that you said like from 03 I don't know, on, onward, like what kind of projects were y'all doing? So initially we got all that stuff to work on my brother's project. Okay. Um, at the time I was still in college. So um, I was working on a couple of uh, projects for some people at school. Okay. So it was like uh, indie stuff. Um, back then it was, I was really into the Neo Soul stuff. Yeah. Like this is like um, right after Music Soul Child, NDRE. Yeah, man. Uh, like that D'Angelo voodoo, it kind of just came out. That was like my vibe, that, that Slum Village stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was working on gospel, but at the same time, man, I just had a love for like the the old, that, that kind of hip hop and the Neo Soul stuff at the same time. Right. So that was primarily what I was working on. Man. Yeah, that that was that was it. That was the sound, man. Everybody was kind of tapping into that at that time. It, it was like, for, as far as black music is concerned, it was like the pop music at that point, you know. It was definitely. Yeah, yeah, man, that's that, that's that's amazing, Pat. So, t tell me about the uh, the evolution, like to, from from then to now. Like, walk me through what you're using now in your studios. Um, let me see. So, my home studio consists of, of course, my MacBook Pro. Um, I have. I'm primarily still using Pro Tools. Yes, as you should be. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I have Logic. I have Ableton, mm -hmm. which I, I recently dove into Ableton for my first live playback show with Tam probably like a month or two ago. Okay. It I got a little interesting, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, it yeah. It got a little interesting because during soundcheck, bro, everybody's, you know, everybody's been telling me for years and since we were doing that Medea deal. Yeah. Oh man, you gotta switch to Ableton. Like it never crashes. It's great. It doesn't do anything. So uh, my deal was this: like, bro, the way my Pro Tools rig is set up, it never crashes. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I, I think you were there for probably 130 shows or so. Yep. No hiccups out of Pro Tools. Zero. Ever. Like, so I, I feel like I'm a living witness. I'm a testimony. Yep. <laughs> of the stability to Pro Tools. And so um, let's t talk about that though. So, so. I, I have a, a indication of why that was the case, but walk me through what your Pro Tools session looked like for those live shows and why so, it was so stable. My playback rig is strictly for playback. Mm -hmm. Strictly for playback. So I don't have my home pictures on there, my home videos. I don't have a bunch of music that I've been listening to on there. I'm using this machine for work. Yep. It is strictly for playback. So it is set up for playback. So, um, so all my disk space is not used by other stuff. Yep. Uh, the other thing I like to do is um, with even the stuff with the plugins on it, 
I record the plugins on there, so I'm just having eight audio files playing at a time. Yep. So what what I do for my live shows, say like um, for Miss Tam's show, we probably have fifteen to twenty songs in there mm-hmm. in one session. Yep. So I have all the songs in one session. Um, all drums on one track, all vocals on one track. You know, down down click. Yeah. music all that all on, but i'm only using eight tracks right even though it's 15 songs i'm only playing back eight tracks yep and and then at this at the same time like i i just i've never had any problems with it because i feel like i use my machine for playback i don't think you can in pro tools i don't think you can use your home you can use your computer for like your regular work stuff sending emails downloading all kinds of stuff and then want to use it for playback yeah, man, you're, you're on point with that, man. And some people would, would say, like, well, that's the point of having a powerful computer. But I'm like, if you you should have a dedicated machine that's just for it's, it. Think about if you were using, like, back in the day, we used to use, like, the Roland 2480s or the 1680s. Mm-hmm. That's all that was for was playback. We weren't, you couldn't mm-hmm. do anything else on it. So you got to treat your computer the same way. And with Pro Tools, they, they are finicky with other stuff running in the background. Because it's, exactly. because it draws on so so much and needs so much power, you can't have a lot of stuff bogging it down. So like within your session, you talked about it. You know, you don't got a lot of uh, plugins on. You're just basically playing audio files. Period. Yes, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I'm using it like uh like I used to have a 1680, a Roland 1680, mm-hmm. and I'm basically using it using Pro Tools the same way as a 1680. Yeah. So I'm I'm not running plugins while the session is going on. Right. Like we you yes, we did use plugins to mix and master. And then but we recorded that stuff onto the track. Yeah. So what we're playing back is literally just the audio. Yeah, man. That's the way to do it, man. And and I know like the technology now has gotten so cool. Um there's a there's a uh I play connectivity, I think is the name of it. It's an interface that you can basically run a redundant computer all from the same interface. So I have that one. Okay, okay. H- how do you like that? I love it. I actually love it. Uh, it's pretty portable. Um, I haven't done the redundancy thing with that one. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of years back, we did a tour with Miss Tam where we were having some trouble. The video people were having trouble Okay. Uh, syncing with the Pro Tools, and then their computer kept quitting. Mm. Um, my good brother at the time who was working with us is uh, Erskine Hawkins. Yeah, shout out to Erskine. Yeah, came up with a genius idea, which <laughs> to play the videos back through Pro Tools. Yeah. Um, everybody told us it will never work. It's going to stop. And it did. But what we did was uh, we hooked up two video computers and ran them together. Mm. So when one stopped, the other one yeah, just... kicked in immediately. Yeah. Uh, and, and this was in Pro Tools probably, I want to say that was probably like 2018. So I'm here to tell you like the like the possibilities of what you can do inside Pro Tools is amazing still. Absolutely, man. It is, man. And I'm not trying to like dump on any other dogs because they're all great in their own right. They all do some really mm-hmm. great things. But for me, just the reliability of the, the I can do anything I want in Pro Tools anything and and it makes more sense like for us you know because we came up in more in a more linear type thing working in um you know traditional recording studios you know routing one for one kind of thing right you know aux buses Mm -hmm. pro tools is like that newer now the guys who are coming up now ableton makes sense to them i look at an ableton screen and i'm like i don't know what's happening right now (laughs) <laughs> so but right. that's not the that's not the dump on Ableton. It's really great. I've worked in live sessions with Ableton and it's always been fine for the most part. But I yeah. just I don't have time to learn another doll like that. There you go. So <laughs> what I tell people uh is like, man, uh work in what you know well. Yeah. For uh, sure. It, it's nothing like it's nothing like being on stage or being in a session and something goes wrong and you have to troubleshoot it but you don't know how to do it because you don't un- you don't understand this da. Yeah. So like whatever da you know, if you know logic well, master that. Yep. 
Uh, if you know Ableton well, master that. For me, it just so happens that I've been in Pro Tools for like 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty quick and knowledgeable in that one. So that's just the one I use. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that's great advice, man. Great mm -hmm. advice. Okay, so let's go back to your, your studio. So you're using Pro Tools. You're, um, you're, you're using a MacBook Pro. What else do you have in your studio that's in your regular day-to-day -day workflow? My day-to-day -day workflow, um, I'm using a Behringer X32 as my interface. Okay. Um, I use that as my interface occasionally. I have a couple Focusrite joints. I have the Scarlet. I got the Cleric mm -hmm. um, that are way more portable. Right. Like if I need to like go mobile and do something like that. Uh, but for the most part, I'm using uh, the X32 as my main interface at home. Uh, I have these Personas... Uh, speakers that i swear by okay uh i use the personas joints and then i have uh the equators as well nice. that are like really really well balanced i use the equators more when mixing okay uh i use the the personas for playback i feel like they just got so much power uh it just makes the room feel warmer but the clarity for the equators uh i feel like it translates more in the mix process like i feel like yeah. when i get in my car that's still what it sounds like nice yeah, that's good, man. I mean, and, 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 you know, again, there's tons of great studio monitors on the market, but you got to know your room. And if you know your room, you know how to mix in your room. You know how to compensate for right. whatever frequency issues you may have. But that that's amazing, man. Um, so are you doing, or let me ask you like this. How, how many tracks at one time are you recording? Because you got the X32, you got the capability to record 32 XLR inputs, or, you know, if you got Dante, you could do more than that. Like, how, in your studio, what's the most amount of tracks you've recorded at one time? So, I bought the stage box for the X32. Okay. So, I wanted to be able to record all 32 at one time if I had to. Nice. It's kind of overkill for home, honestly. Right. Because um, I actually have an office in Arlington. I have another studio in Arlington that I work out of. And we have that, uh, we have a Control 24, the old, the old, oh, yeah. uh, the, the old Digi Designer yeah. with, uh, but we're running it with um, the Quantum. Oh, okay. Which one? Um, ooh, I cannot remember off the top of my head. Because they got the 4848 and then they got like the, it's a, it's a 32 one. I can't remember, but. How, how do you like we're that? We're running two of them. We're running two of them to give us 24 tracks okay. total at one time. Okay. Do they sound pretty good? So I don't, it actually sounds kind of amazing, man. Yeah. Like, seriously. I was surprised. Yeah, I've heard good things, man. I've heard good things. I've, I've never got a chance to use it. I was looking at the um, the Quantum 4848 when I first built my, my room. Um, but it just, I think because it had old, like, um, protocols as far as connectivity thunderbolt i think it's like thunderbolt 2 and i just the, with the comp new computers i needed something more current without me having to figure out like a dongle situation so but yeah that's that's amazing man so in in your so you record you mix in your studio mm -hmm. and how like how, how how's your uh how's your workflow going these days like if somebody wants to get Patrick Wright to produce something or mix something, like how does that process work for you? Well, let me, uh, so there's, I'm not a mix master yet. This is like a skill that I'm still like working on daily. Yeah, for sure. Uh, luckily, like one of our close friends is the cheat code. Oh, and man. like, so he keep like, so Rico keeps yeah. me sweet every time. Yeah. So uh, what what he'll do is he'll come and he'll set up a, a mix session for me. Okay. And allow me to kind of like import my files into his premix session. That's a great way to start, man. <laughs> right. So and, and then I kind of start from there. He like he gives me a huge head start. Yeah, man. So, uh, but my deal more I'm I'm more of an arranger producer type, you know. So I'm the type of so where I like to start on stuff that I want you to just send me a vocal and a click. Okay. And then let me build all the elements around your vocal. Yeah. Um, I Like in my younger day, I used to like, I used to track all the time. 
So I would just have like catalogs, catalogs of tracks mm-hmm. that I'm trying to sell to people. Um, I don't really do that anymore. I'm like, for me, it's more of like, um, it's more of like a tailored suit. Like I want right. to build this thing to fit you yeah. individually. Yeah. So even from from sound selection uh, to a, to arrangement, something that's going to complement your voice. Mm. So I I ask you to send me a, a voice memo to a click, so you can sing it in your phone. Yeah. Uh, a, with a metronome, and then I just take it from there and then start painting the picture from there. Man, that that's a great way to work, man. Uh, I think I want to say I just heard something a couple of weeks ago that you may have produced by um, Carla Williams. Yeah, yeah. Her and her daughter, I think, put out something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, that was a, that was a nice project, man. Great song, man. Man, thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you. And and Carla kind of did the exact same thing. She sent me over a voice memo, and uh, we kind of just built it out from the voice memo. Nice. And Carla's a, such a great singer. Oh, I've phenomenal. never met her daughter before, and her daughter is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like the the tone that both of them have. Uh, it it was just it was a beautiful song and from beautiful vocalists. It was really good. Yeah, man. No, that 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 was a great great song, and uh, I love that process that you have working with artists. You know, just kind of it, it's it's a case by case thing. You know, I, I know exactly. it's out here these days, man. It's hard, man, as a or it can be hard as a musician slash producer to to find placements and all that kind of stuff. But to be able to have the reputation that you have for people to come to you, to trust you with that is a big deal. Thank you. Man. Yeah, Thank man. You. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. So, okay. So in, in that process, how, how do you balance like serving the artists and what they want, it, but still like flexing your artistic muscle? Like how, how does that work for you? It, it's a it's a very very careful balance because like um, what I've learned like now I don't really try to talk artists into doing anything that they not feeling right like at the end of the day it's your song and I want you to be comfortable yeah uh, the flip side to that is that most of the people that come to me come to me because they trust me they trust my ears mm-hmm. and uh, knowing that the like I don't really like skimp out like. Right now, I'm doing a lot of indie stuff, like a bunch of indie artist stuff. Okay. And I figured out that that's kind of like what I like doing. That's like my passion. Right. It's getting like folks that don't have access to super producers. Right. Really good music, really good arrangement, really good quality. Right. And uh, so the folks that reach out to me normally trust me enough to be like, oh, well, I, tr- I don't need, like, I don't agree with that necessarily, but I trust you. So I know you know what you're doing is going to turn out great. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, man. Uh, you got to have that balance, and um, again, you know, it's it's that that trust between artist and producer that you got to cultivate, and, and and if it's there, it's gonna it's gonna yield good results most of the time, mm-hmm. most of the time, man. So, what what do you what do you think sets sets apart a a, a good recording from a great one? Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll oversimplify and start with signal flow. Talk about um, it, man. Talk about it. Thank you. I'm glad that you're going there. I, I, I think what, like, a good recording to a great recording is the difference for me would be, are, are the files clean? Man. Like, start with the most basic things. Like, whatever, whatever you put into this DAW, this is what you're sending to a mix engineer. Yep. He can't work magic with a distorted vocal. Garbage in, garbage uh, out. You know, exactly. And I, I think the, the attention to detail would be the difference in between good and great. Because it's a, it's a lot of folks with DAWs who are really talented, mm-hmm. who hear really good. Most Like most musicians now are, you know, sweet in one DAW or another. Right. Like they're, they're pretty good. But uh, I think where we miss the mark sometimes with our musicality is is we don't have that engineer's ear. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what's from good to great is like good is, OK, this sounds cool. But it, the quality of it isn't great because of how you recorded it at the beginning. Yeah, for sure, man. Like a, a, as a mix engineer, man, my biggest pet peeve 
is getting a session that is unorganized that is um sounds bad distorted and then the expectation is that i'm supposed to fix this and make it sound good like that's that's a pet peeve of mine but you know i, I take on the challenge as best i can but with that said what's your process like so you you, you get with the artist mm -hmm. you produce and arrange a song you get it to the point where you want to get it mixed how how, or what is your process to sending this to a mix engineer? Like, what are you doing and what do you believe a producer's responsibility is before sending it off to a mix engineer? Um, so before, I feel like I was doing it wrong because I didn't know better because all of my mix engineers were my friends. Mm -hmm. So they would look over my terrible flaws and faults and just fix it and it'd be no big deal. Right. Um, so I feel like it's my responsibility as producer to when I give you this session, you're really kind of just mixing it. Mm -hmm. So I'll have all my edits done. Yep. I'll have my auto-tune done already on the vocals. Like auto-tune done, all the edits done, so you won't have to, everything's named properly. And what I've been doing lately is I'm sending you my actual session. Yes. So I'm not sending you the files. I'm sending you the session so it's easier that way. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sending you a two, inside the session is a two track of a mix that I've done already. Yes. So like, I want it to sound like this, but I want it just to be polished. Yes. So you, you're not just stabbing in the dark, you know, searching for tones that I don't think should be there. Right. You know, I'm kind of giving you an outline of how I want it to sound. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's the producer's responsibility to get the files to you um edited already mix m mixing and editing are two different stages that is right that is absolute facts, uh, facts. we don't know that it's musician stuff we don't know <laughs> <laughs> you know but but that is definitely something that you know musicians who want to get into production have to learn and know and that way because because you want to have good relationships with with engineers and uh, and to be able to just, like you said, it, it it starts from the beginning of the signal flow. Like if you learn all that stuff as a producer, man, your stuff is going to, it's going to sound better and better every time. And I know, man, like it's just, it's just hard, man, dealing with some, some sessions, but going back to like Pro Tools, this is why I believe Pro Tools still is the industry standard because most mix engineers, most, not all, but most work in Pro Tools. And so Absolutely. for a producer to be able to actually send your session in a Pro Tools session, man, that that makes me happy when I when I whenever I get a new client and they say, you know, I'm gonna just send you my Pro Tools session, I'm like, thank you. That's one less right. step I have to do, you know, to get things going. But yeah, man. That's amazing, man. I, I'm so tell tell us some projects now that over the last couple of years that you've worked on and anything that's coming out that you want us to know about. Um, let me see. The last couple of years, I did a song for Carla Williams before, probably a year or so ago, called uh, "Run Into You." Okay. I did that one with her. I did this recent one, which was like a holiday one. Um, I did a song for Mike Sneed and his family uh, called "DNA." Okay. Uh, which was really good. I did a song with Crystal Bird out of San Antonio called Never Let Go of Your Faith. Um, uh, my favorite joint that I had worked on was an album that we were all worked on for Valentino Maltos out in uh, a saxophone player, jazz saxophone player out of San Antonio. Okay. And uh, Rico mixed the whole record. Um, I played organ on probably like four of the songs. I think Bobby Sparks played organ on like uh, three or four songs. And then... Um, Mike Robinson played organ. Okay. So it was, I really liked like splitting organ time with Bobby Sparks and Mike Robinson, bro. Hey, Making man. me feel like I know how to play the organ. That hey, you <laughs> up there, bro. You make it in this like, world. You don't get no better than that. <laughs> That's what's up, man. Especially with like Bobby being like one of my lifelong heroes that I've been following since like I was a child. 
So, like, we've worked on some music together, but it's always normally, like, me calling him saying, hey, man, can you work on this with me? Mm -hmm. So, for us both to get the same call on the same record, for me, was, like, really, really cool. Yeah, man. Shout out to Bobby um, Sparks, man. Like yeah, man. <laughs> the yes, keyboard sir. extraordinaire. He's, like, the guru. For me, he was, like, the standard of, like, how you play keys. <laughs> Absolutely, man. And he's so unlike everybody else. So much. He, he's Bobby just, is Bobby. He is in his own world, and I love Bobby, man. He's a close friend, and I'm, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have him on here as well uh, soon. So, yeah, shout out to Dude. Bobby Sparks. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah, man. Um, what's coming up is we're starting to work on a new Tamil Man record. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, you know. I'm I'm excited to be a part of that, to be on the team for that. I'm very excited to be a part of it. Man, that's amazing, bro. And you know, if you ever need some percussion, I mean, you know. Oh, you know who I'm calling, Darius. <laughs> you already know it, brother. <laughs> yes, sir. Shameless plug. But <laughs> right. hey man, I I love me some David and Tamla. They are like the they are the most genuine people, especially in the music business. Mm -hmm. Like to to have that type of character that's consistent that they are they just are always the best man they are always the best man and they have not changed since i've known them wow since i think I'm, i probably started coming around around when i was 12 or so yeah and they have been the exact same since i was 12 that's amazing man that's a testament to them man just they are true honorable people and I, i'm sure for you it's been a blessing to be able to serve alongside them absolutely yeah that's awesome man so so tell me man like think think of your experiences in the studio can you mm -hmm. tell me the craziest thing that's ever happened or that you've ever witnessed in the studio man my studio spaces have always been super chill yeah I always been so I think uh, <laughs> the the craziest thing that ever happened wasn't even really crazy. I remember we were doing a session and then I called a homie to play flute, right? Mm -hmm. And he sent a sub. He was like at the last minute he sent a sub over there, and um, I mean this guy was terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> See that's that's some um, a terrible he was... a terrible flautist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean he was awful. Wow. And, um, so we got to the point now where we're, hey, you know, we're kind of burning time now. Because yeah. this, was, this was not at a home studio. This was at, oh, like, wow. somebody's, yeah, I'm like, hey, we're, bur we're burning time. So um, we're discussing this in the control room. <laughs> <laughs> we're discussing this in the control room. Oh, God. And then we're like, yeah, yeah, let's just have him do it, you know, just have him do it one more time just so he don't feel bad. And then we'll just send him home and replace all the stuff. Oh, God. Not not knowing that 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 talk back was still talk on. back was still on, bro. Oh man, I'm sure we all got stories like that. <laughs> yeah, everybody got that one. I'm sure. Oh, right? That's the worst, man. Right. <laughs> so, so so what 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 did he do? How did he let y'all know that he could hear y'all talking? He was like, hey hey hey, uh, I I can still hear y'all. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, man. Like, <laughs> it, wait, yeah. so here's a, here's the question. Did y'all let him do another take? <laughs> we did, oh, actually. He, was, what, what? he said he was going to nail it. Oh, God. He was like, yeah, yeah, I got y'all. I promise you, I'm going to nail this one. Did he? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the door, sir. Right. <laughs> like, that's crazy, man. No, that's funny, man. Oh, Pat, man, this has been great, man. So, man, we gonna wind this down, but tell tell us, man, if you can if you can give any advice to any upcoming producers, artists, engineers, any anybody looking to get into this world of recording and production, man, what what would you say to these people coming up? Uh, probably just like two things. One one of them is consistency. Um, this is something that you have to do on a regular basis. Yeah. Like, if you want to get good, I feel like if you want to get good at anything, you have to, like, commit yourself to the excellence in the process of getting to be excellent. Yeah. 
So it's like you have to practice being excellent every day. Um, this is also something that we do that you can never stop learning at. Mm -hmm. No matter how good you think you are, or and you may be super good, there's always more things to learn in music, in recording, engineering. There's always more things to learn. Yeah. So like the consistency of committing yourself to the learning process learn long term. The other thing I, I would say is uh, trust your gut. Mm -hmm. So if this song feels good to you, if this mix feels good to you, go with that. Like if what you're playing, if you like what you're playing, like what comes from you, it's always going to speak volumes to somebody else. To like what comes from the heart touches the heart. So like if you're going with your your gut, I feel like you'll always be putting your best foot forward. Mm. Yes, sir, man. That's that's great mm -hmm. advice, man. Always staying true to yourself, man, is always the best way to go, for sure, man. Mm -hmm. Well, Pat, man, I want to thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Uh, I appreciate your gift. I appreciate your friendship. And, man, you've always been a consistent friend and uh, co-worker and colleague. So thank you, man, for coming on and, and blessing this channel. Man, of course, Darius, anytime, bro. You, it's always good times with you, man. Miss you, brother. Yeah, man. <laughs> no, we, we live too close to not see each other more. We really do. We're going to work on that. Right, right. Yes, sir. Well, y'all, thank y'all for coming out and hanging with us uh, for this chat in the studio with my brother Patrick Wright. Remember, smash that subscribe button if you haven't. I got some great content coming, and I want all you guys to check it out. Please share this episode. Comment. Let us know what you think. But until next time, we'll see you later. Peace.